I'm creating a new series about how to write a song. The first video was an attempt to dispel myths about creativity because I feel like it's really important to understand that creativity is a skill. Practice it and you will get better. This video is about how to write a chorus because it's easy to argue that choruses are the most important part of a song. Not necessarily the most important part of every song and there's loads of songs that don't have something that you would call a chorus within them. But the point of this video is to give you some practical rules or guidelines to follow so that you can make a chorus for your song. The next logical question is how? How are we going to find some rules for creating choruses? How are these rules actually going to help us and how do we do that without actually sounding super generic? The only real way I know how to do this is to dissect some some successful compositions and see what they did. Once we've got a pool of data, we can start to identify some patterns that are there and help us narrow our search into what a chorus might be. And in the end, we'll have a method to approach creating a chorus. The songs I've picked are Thriller by Michael Jackson, The End of Heartache by Killswitch Engage, Do I Wanna Know by The Arctic Monkeys, Can't Hold Us by McElbore and Ryan Lewis, Levitating by Dua Lipa, Show Me How to Live by Audio Slave, Cats in the Cradle by Harry Chapin, Duality by Slipknot, Little Lies by Fleetwood Mac, and Counting Stars by One Republic. I created this list for two reasons. One, I like every single song on this list, and two, it's diverse as fuck. Sure, some of the songs are similar, but if we can find a pattern that applies to Dua Lipa, Slipknot, the Arctic Monkeys, Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, we can bet that these rules are going to apply to most other songs as well. Naturally, I won't be able to play you any of these tracks, but they are linked below. However, you won't need the audio examples. This is just an exercise in looking at what they're doing and synthesizing ideas from that. We don't need to listen to it to understand. I found that every chorus did a few basic things. Every chorus felt like an emotional high point, like a climax, a big moment. It always felt as if the verse was asking a question and the chorus was the answer. Every chorus opened up. Most songs had a new instrument or a symbol that came in to signify that we're now in the chorus. In duality and the end of heartache, it meant going from fast, heavily palm muted rhythmic riffs to open chords that are on a simple chord progression. In Can't Hold Us, a new singer came in with a totally different tonal palette than what we'd heard up to any point in this song. Every single song went all in with the instruments. In Little Lies, Thriller and Levitating, a new instrument came in that was bright and exciting. Nearly every chorus had the highest note that we'd heard so far. For every single song, the chorus was more simple both rhythmically and melodically than the verse. Every chorus had backing vocals that were either a group vocal following the melody or a harmony. And finally, every single chorus used repetition. The most important thing about all of this is to create a climax. Climaxes can be seen as emotional high points of the track. It's pretty easy to see that humans find group vocals, high pitch, bright, sparkly instruments, and emotively sung vocals to be exciting. If you can apply those to a simple, memorable, and repeatable melody, you're gonna have yourself a chorus. On to harmony. For anyone who doesn't know, harmony refers to the chords played in a song. Every single chorus in our list started with the one chord. What I mean by that is if we're in the scale of E major, then the one chord is the E major chord. If you don't know this stuff or you get lost by me talking about the first or the second or the third chord, Google diatonic harmony. Chord one was obviously the most popular being used 19 times within the 10 songs. Chord 2 only appeared in duality. Chord 3 was the second most popular, being used 11 times within the 10 songs. Chord 4 was the next most popular, being used 10 times in the 10 songs. However, three of those times were in the parallel minor. What do I mean by the parallel minor? It means that if we're in a major scale, the 4 chord should be a major chord. If we use the minor chord on the 4 there, it is a parallel minor. We're not in a minor key, we're just using the chord as if it were the minor key that was playing. So to repeat myself, out of the 10 choruses, the four chord was used 10 times, three of those times in its minor form. The five chord was only used three times, the six chord was used six times, and the seven chord was used nine times. For those who know a bit more about music theory, the seven chord often functions like the five chord, but that's a different topic. Six of the 10 songs used four chords. Two of the 10 songs only used three chords. The most popular progression being used by four of the 10 songs was the one, five, six, four progression or a variation of it. There are four songs that broke the idea of what might be normal. Those songs are Show Me How to Live, Duality, Thriller, and Cats in the Cradle. Duality, whilst atypical harmony from a chordal point of view or a normal analysis, it is very, very normal for metal. The interesting thing about this song is it lives somewhere between 
the B minor and the B diminished scale. The notes in the melody and chords pull from either the B diminished or the B minor scale at any point in time relatively randomly. So to analyze it on a piece of music from like one beat to the next that might be B diminished and then B minor. The way that I analyze this is you basically just exist freely, whatever sounds best to your ear between those two scales. This makes it really annoying to analyze when you're trying to do a proper analysis of the song. However, stylistically, it is really, really super, super common in metal, but it's just mega atypical when you're looking at classical or classical derived harmony. Cats in the Cradle uses lots of parallel chords. This is what I talked about when I was talking about the four chord and how three of the 10 of them were in their minor form. This gives Cats in the Cradle its folky, bluesy, somewhat melancholy, dejected, but also somewhat uplifting. It's like it allows Cats in the Cradle to push and pull your mood because sometimes they're going to use the major and sometimes they're going to use the minor. Thriller uses a very bluesy progression, focusing more on the third and fourth chord of the scale, but also uses parallel minors and a borrowed chord. Show Me How to Live doesn't really have harmony per se. It's more of a riff. Often riffs have no harmonic movement. They're more like a drone or a pedal tone. But this is a topic for another video. Show Me How to Live does have the underpinnings of a chord progression. For the purposes of the video, I ignored the fact that it is a riff and kind of created a harmony out of it to analyze it. Harmony lays the foundation for melody. As we can clearly see, simple chord progressions can make for great songs with great melodies. But you can also do some interesting things if you want to step outside of what is normal. Onto melody. When I did my analysis of these 10 songs, I anticipated that I would see the following things. Number one, all melodies would pretty much follow their pentatonic version of the scale. Number two, the first, the third, and the fifth notes would be the most used. And number three, most melodies would have leaps of a third or greater. I will explain this soon. So was I correct? Yes, I was right in that most songs were based around the pentatonic with only one song breaking this mold being Cats in the Cradle. Every other song mostly used the second or the sixth as a passing tone, not as a very important melody note. However, I was wrong in my assumption that the first, the third, and the fifth were going to be the clear winners. Turns out that the fifth was the most commonly used note, followed by the third, and the first and the seventh received about equal attention. This does not mean you need to use the fifth. My pool of music just happened to have a lot of fifths in it. Maybe I just listen to and like melodies that have the fifth as the big climactic note. I don't know. Don't read into it until you've done your own analysis. The third guess was that most of the songs would have big leaps making up the majority of the melody. Whilst most songs did have big leaps in them, there are three or four songs that I would say don't actually really fit into this category. Cats in the Cradle, Levitating, and Little Lies to a lesser extent used melodies that were based around stepwise motion. What this means is that most of these melodies were going from the first scale degree to the second, to the third, to the fourth, or whatever. If they were doing things like going from the first to the third to the seventh, down to the third again, blah, 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 this is leaping around. My point is, is there was a bunch of songs that didn't really leap around that much. Cats in the Cradle is unique because it only used the first, the second, the fifth, and the seventh scale degrees. But the only thing that makes this unique is that instead of using the third, like most melodies would have, it used the second. And I tried to play that song using the third instead, it sounded way worse. The point is use your ear. My guess that the first scale degree would be the most popular with the seventh being significantly less explored was clearly wrong, but that's okay. That's why we do these things. On to rhythm. I was actually surprised to find that things were pretty rhythmically simple in most cases. The end of heartache was by far the most simple with no syncopation. For those who don't know, a syncopated rhythm is a rhythm that doesn't fall perfectly on the beat. If like the end of heartache, the rhythm of the melody falls perfectly in time every time, then it is not syncopated. Most of the choruses had a very simple rhythmic structure. Usually the melodic rhythm was a pattern based around the beat like this, or with subdivisions of the beat like this. There are three notable mentions being levitating, duality, and thriller. Levitating uses this rhythmic grouping. This is a simple subdivision as I've mentioned above, but it's actually quite uncommon for this to be the main hook of the song. Duality's chorus has one big long held note and a few words that are spat out at you before another big long held note. These spat words make use of an anacrusis, which is where the rhythm starts before the first beat of the bar. So in duality, the anacrusis is the things leading up to the big climactic note. At the start of the chorus, that's, I push my fingers into my, 
and then eyes being the big climactic note. And then the, when it cycles, the words slowly stop the ache are the ones that kind of act as the anacrusis leading into the next big climactic note. What I'm going to do is change around the rhythms for slowly stops the ache and you'll see how these offset rhythms pushing you into the next big climactic note kind of really force you there and push you into it rather than kind of laying back and allowing it to happen to you. So let's have a listen the way that it's originally intended. Right, we're all used to that if we've heard duality. And if we're not, then you've just heard the rhythms. However, if we take those slowly stops the ache and we move them so that they land on the beat, this is what it sounds like. Nothing wrong with this sound, but it's a metal song. We want it to feel like we're in a rush. We want it to feel exciting. To do that, Slipknot throw you off balance before giving you the next big climactic note. I've been saying this for a while, but Slipknot can be pretty damn close to pop with their musical choices. I'm not mad at it, but they tend to follow pop conventions and dress it up and disguise it as metal. For Thriller, there's a bunch of different stuff that's happening that is really cool. They even use dotted rhythms. I'm not gonna analyze it in heaps of detail, but the point is there's the combination of the climactic high held note with with simple rhythmic values, other parts that use common subdivisions, and other parts that use other more interesting rhythmic techniques. They keep everything very sensible. They're making sure that they're adhering to the groove absolutely before they're making these crazy rhythmic choices. But if you had the choice, would you opt for something more groovy, more interesting, rather than leaving it be something that could just get stale over time? One thing in common that every single song shares is that to a certain extent, the words dictate the rhythm. For example, if we've got the lyric from Do I Wanna Know, crawling back to you, ever thought of calling when you'd had a few? We are not going to sing it. Crawling back to you, ever thought of calling when you'd had a few? No, we're going to use the words in a normal way. No one says ever with both syllables in the word having equal emphasis unless the word itself needs to be massively emphasized. They're going to say ever with the emphasis being where it should be on the word. Every single song did this. No one chose to break a word just to fit a rhythm or to break a rhythm just to fit a word. Sure, some things push and pull and that's what you need to do. But it's really rare in popular music that people break a word or a rhythm just to fit the other in. They work and work and work to find a more suitable solution. So in summary, point number one, a chorus is a climax. Make sure that it feels exciting. Use extra instruments, use backing vocals to get this point across. Number two, we want to ensure that the musical background supporting the melody feels simple and open. Number three, harmonically, we want a handful of chords to write our song around. Start with the first chord in the scale and then use pretty much any diatonic chord that you feel sounds good. And if you can't find a good sound using those diatonic chords, start stepping out into something a bit more experimental. Number four, the melody should be based around the pentatonic. Remember, our favorite notes are the third and the fifth followed by the first and the seventh. And that, once again, is just what the data in this video says. I don't believe it fully. Number five, the melody should contain at least one big, long-held climactic note that is probably the highest note we've heard so far in the song. And finally, number six, it should be a simple, memorable, and repeatable melody that has a simple rhythmic structure to it. So in my eyes, that's a pretty simple set of rules to follow. Try create something, let your ear guide you, and if you struggle with any part of that creation process, then refer to this list. Final note before I go, break the rules. This final point that I'm adding on, to me, is just as important as the list we just looked at. Each of these songs is pretty hugely popular for the band that they're in, and yet none of the choruses fit every single one of the rules perfectly. As I said above, use your ear. It's going to be your most powerful tool and your best friend. If you create a chorus that's perfect and you haven't used the highest note, like Cats in the Cradle, or you haven't used Pentatonic, like Crawling Back to You, or you haven't used any syncopation like The End of Heartache, or you haven't used diatonic chords like Thriller. It's totally okay, it actually doesn't matter. However, the point of this list is this is something that you can use when you can't figure out why your chorus doesn't sound as good as you want it to sound. Maybe you've only used one chord and you need three or four or 10 to make your chorus sound the way that you want it to sound. Maybe your melody focuses on the fourth and sixth scale degrees and you wonder why it doesn't feel as amazing. Refer to this list and you've got a simple set of answers that you can try. You get the point. So there you have it, after analyzing 10 songs, you can see what rules apply. However, a chorus without a verse is just as useless as no chorus at all. Subscribe below and hit the notification bell so that you can get my next video, which is about how to write a verse.